I've got six pieces in here and six pages in here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these are just sort of placed so that one could stand on either side. Right. And Beautiful see spacing. Three. A curator on a college campus is a difficult role. You're looking for the resources and the funding to bring artists in to a campus that, you know, might have a lot of money or a lot of funding and resources in the sciences, in the hard sciences, right? And how does the UMCA place itself on a, a list of importance um, is very difficult, but I think Loretta, as a curator, has surrounded herself with people that also help to bring in those resources in order to not make the UMCA irrelevant. It's very relevant. Du Bois in Our Time, to me, was a, a huge example of bringing a large spotlight to the UMCA globally. Art is a, a discourse. It's a place where communications can happen. It's a place where thoughts are provoked. It's a place where feelings are provoked. And it's also a place of wonder and kind of curiosity and what is this kind of thing here and what does it mean and what does it represent and how, how can I interact with it? The University Museum of Contemporary Art is a really important part of the university. It's a collecting museum. It curates uh, world-renowned artists and exhibitions. It's won all kinds of grants. It's also a teaching museum, so it invites people from the university to go in and curate shows from their collection. And Loretta is someone who's really special. It doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter your job title. If you have a good idea, she wants you in the room. From the very moment I was talking to Loretta, I got the impression, and it got confirmed many times over afterwards, her deep knowledge about contemporary art, about artists, about institutions, about the prominent galleries that are showing contemporary artists and her instinctual knowledge of what she would like to show and how she would go about. That was just always remarkable and lit fire in me because I got so excited about the possibility of having a certain artist coming and an exhibition coming our way. Having these connections were just incredibly energizing. Originally, the University Museum of Contemporary Art was called the University Gallery. It was not quite clear with that name if it was just an exhibition space or if it is actually a museum. This space had a permanent collection, but Loretta had to fight very hard, a lot of red tape. What this museum has in its collection is a remarkable range of contemporary art from the 1950s on to the present, and the incredible caliber of artists that we have in the collection. Only if you go in and look at the images, which can be accessed by everybody who has a computer, you can see the depth of this and the remarkable history that the museum has since its inception. People who are very familiar with contemporary art will be amazed of what we have. It takes love for art and artists. Uh, it takes knowledge and skill and entrepreneurial spirit. And it's ultimately the work of a storyteller.
you're helping to tell not only your own story and, and the story of your own passion with regard to contemporary art, but that of the artists. And you're hoping that that story resonates with everyone who comes in to the museum. And Loretta has been phenomenal at that. I don't know many people who could do what she has done. Great. She's just a bright star. She just loves to kind of shine the light. State institutions are always scrambling for money and resources are scarce, but you know, Loretta's insistence on finding funding and, and finding the benefactors and the supporters for the museum, for its holdings, what she has brought in, you know, thinking about the Warhol collection, it, it really is tied to the ambitions of the institution in a way. It's a credit to her, but also, you know, her understanding as well uh, of just how important the place of art is at this institution. Of course, we're a land grant university, and so part of that is really about making engagement and connection. Loretta and I had some conversations about how great it would be to put together an exhibition that was bridging art and architecture. And I think that was the idea with Crosstown Contemporary Art. It was sort of like, how can we activate these spaces, not just in a show that lasts for eight months, but, but you know, more permanently? How can we create infrastructures and spaces that are inspirational and creative that make people want to dwell there? Went from Hagus Mall um, here on campus and outside of these, these doors here at the Fine Arts Center um, through and into uh, Kendrick Park uh, in, in Amherst. And the works were, were challenging from uh, Sarah Brayman's little house that she had on, on Kendrick Park to Tom Friedman's piece that was at the old Brat Row elevating the conversation and, and making our little small burg of Amherst a place of of art, contemplation, and conversation. I think art has a way of making spaces come alive. You know, that, that's how big things happen. You know, they start with something small like that. It starts with a kind of prototype, so it allows people to, to get a glimpse of what could happen. for this campus and this area and this region to say, we have the Du Bois papers here. You know, the legacy and the access and our campus and Western Mass realizing that this collection was here. And what I came to find out was that many Du Bois scholars had been using the digital collection and that meant that people had seen the papers without ever coming to UMass. And so as the Du Bois Center kind of becomes a reality, we have Loretta Yarlow reaching out and writing this amazing grant to bring scholars and artists together. And she said, I've heard that you've been looking at Du Bois' photo albums. I heard you've been looking at his high school and college papers. I bet you have something to tell us. I'm working on this show. And the next sentence she said was, and I'm working on it with a lot of people. We're having multiple affinity dinners just to bring people in the room, just to see what ideas bubble up. And I want you in that room. And that became a two and a half year dialogue between Loretta and Ava and I, between the two of them and 20 artists and scholars. And Du Bois in Our Time was as much about Du Bois, his life, his legacy, but it was also about the community that Loretta and Ava created. The beauty of that opening moment with Brendan Fernandez's long care of working with students to conceive of a procession allows the campus to become for a moment a different kind of place. It becomes a place 
of ritual. It becomes a place of movement and collectivity, but to see the students move across campus collectively, it changes their bodies. It changes their relationship to that space for years to come. It changes their relationship to history because they were a part of a moment. The talk on the ethics of beauty, the conversations around that exhibition were truly the first time that I could imagine myself and heard myself making that necessary transition from student to a scholar. I come to Du Bois believing him to be just as integral to the canon of aesthetic thought as Ranciere, Dickinson, Goethe, and Spivak. And though I understand that no human, not even myself, can escape their cultural moment, and though it is perhaps wrong to ask an exceptional man to be even more exceptional in all things and all times, I have to ask, what are the ethics of beauty that Du Bois is working under? To be able to yoke in the way that Du Bois did, a conversation around ethics and politics with an understanding of beauty. It's intuitive, we get this, but the things we call beautiful, the things we value, and the things we value become moral and ethical equations in our lives. But to be able to say that in my own terms, to find my own way to it, it was the first time. It was a joy and one of the most generous offers, even 10 years on, that I've ever been given as a scholar. It meant so much to me and it has defined the last 10 years of my, of my life in so many ways. The catalog is a, a source of pride for this campus. 10, 11, 12 years later, it's still a source of pride. And to think about that vision, right, that is a curate, that's a curator's dream on a campus, right? But that's a curator's dream anywhere, I would think, to, to have that kind of impact. What do we mean when we say this word art? I think the contemporary part is actually very important because it's sort of the connection to living, breathing artists. Art is not just one thing. It's not preset. It's not just from the past, but it's something that's sort of living and breathing and it's always being created by artists. And it's a, it's a creation that the students themselves and the other people on campus can also participate in. It's like the aha moment when you kind of realize like everything is designed, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's everything is sort of designed, which is actually such a freeing thought because it means that everything is open to contestation, like everything is open to being redesigned. The Border Crossed Us was a public art installation that was on the UMass Amherst campus for 10 days and it was a physical border, it was a physical boundary that consisted of a photographic replica of the border fence that is on the Tohono O'odham Nation, which is a group of indigenous people in southern Arizona and in northern Mexico. My sister had moved to Tucson, Arizona. She connected me with Ophelia Rivas, who is an elder of the Tohono O'odham people. Ophelia's land and the Otom land have been there much longer than U.S. and Mexico were countries. Under George W. Bush, a fence had been built through the Tohono O'odham lands, effectively making it extremely difficult for, for passage on, on either side. Ophelia and I started talking about uh, doing something together along the lines of an art project. Then Loretta reached out. She extended a very open invitation. It was almost scary because it was so open, I guess I would say. A lot of times I have been used to working within like very specific parameters of like, well, here's your, you know, poster space or here's this corner that you can be in or whatever. She believed in the work and in the purpose of the work and in the sort of dialogue, the possibilities of what could be sort of instigated by the work. We had all sorts of reactions, you know, curiosity, Many students, I would say, just walk right through. You know, they're just like, oh, there's just a thing in my path. I'm going to go around it, <laughs> you know. 
other folks would sort of come up to the fence and just sort of stand up and look at it and be sort of puzzled about it. What does this policy mean? What is this place for us here who are in New England? How do we talk about the border fence on the Tohono O'odham land, separating Tohono O'odham people from themselves? And how do we think about our relationship to it? We had a number of associated events with the piece as well. So there's like programming, Ophelia visited. She spoke at a powwow that was of the local indigenous peoples. I, I think I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity to have engaged at that scale. I think it was a scale that was like both intimidating to me, uh, but also I feel very proud of that work still. So for me, it's a work that like I hold very close and it kind of like it lives on, and I'm still in conversation with Ophelia to this day. Visual art plays a very important role in forcing students from a wide range of educational fields to reconsider ideas that they've probably thought about already in, in new ways. An image tells a story and speaks to a person's inner being in a way that words don't always. It, it transcends language and therefore it will speak to people in a way that perhaps even they might not be able to define with words. And that is very powerful. I was blessed with the opportunity to be behind the scenes a lot. That is why it feels like home so much. So each year the museum chose one art student from the graduate program and one art history grad student. And we worked together for a whole year, building an exhibition from scratch, looking at artwork, developing themes, write about the show, develop the curatorial essay, learning how to borrow artwork from other institutions. And Loretta, everyone on the team, Jenny, the registrar, Ava, everyone was just so helpful. And I felt like if it wasn't for that experience, I wouldn't have really had the opportunity to learn the, the nitty gritties of how a museum works, especially the behind the scenes. So this is the dialogue with the collection exhibition that the UMCA has done over the years. I chose to take one single piece, very powerful, but one single piece, which is this 10 feet long print by Yun Feiji. Both Yun Feiji's work as well as my work address socio-political issues through allegory, fantastical elements, folklore. I ended up making a scroll in response to, to his scroll. That was a pretty interesting experience just because it, it felt very alive and organic. Not only did I learn a lot, but it was very confidence boosting. Then also just being conscious of my own identity as an artist from India and how that kind of plays a role in the history of just the canon of artists that end up becoming a part of a museum and a part of a country's collection of art and how those thoughts kind of do work itself into my practice. I'm tremendously thankful to Loretta for every door that she has opened for me. She provided and made room for these opportunities which shaped my creative career. She made it possible for me to work with the team, and I cannot thank them enough. They really are like family to me. It sounds like cliche to say, but it's true. <laughs> the show that she had at the museum was one of the most exciting for me as an educator. One, I learned so much from her and from each of her paintings, just told so many stories and, and layers of history and her personal experience. So it was such a joy to teach with her work. Loretta was very invested in the museum being a unique space on campus, unlike other spaces where people from different disciplines could come and gather and think and dream. In terms of staccato and wanting to be mindful, uh, I only envision the one bone. Okay. I think it tells a lot. Largest so many of our most innovative and exciting projects over the last five years have been thanks to the class of 1961 and the funding they provided for a series of artist residencies. 
And how far does this date back to? That enabled us to bring these incredible artists to campus, to explore their ideas, to connect with the different faculty. Our collaboration with the UMCA is a way to bring science to a more general audience. You know, things can be pretty dry where you're just looking at data and things, but then if you involve your other senses into it, it becomes a much more complete experience. The museum's role on campus has expanded in a way that it's more integrated into the life on campus, but also that just the academic departments rely, I think, more on the museum as a resource, which is what we hope for. I think um, I'll begin by saying that, first of all, I'm Sanjay Arwadi from the Department of Civil Engineering. The point I'd like to start with is that this represents art of some kind. And this is the way that a structural engineer might start labeling the Brooklyn Bridge and taking this large, complex physical object and rendering it in symbols that can be used mathematically. Those symbols... Artists present big, swirling, troubling ideas in ways that sort of coalesce into this something that is beautiful or engaging or provocative. It's tremendously inspiring to students to, to think about the different perspectives or, or to even know that what you see can tell you something about the world. In order to get LEED certified, you have to bring in this third party, you have to pay this third party, and so the cost of your construction actually goes up in order to get this certification. While one exhibition isn't going to change the world, if it's part of a larger conversation that's also happening um, in the greater media, in the greater world, it's another drop in that bucket. The case of Greening the Valley, this, this little germ of an idea that came from a very personal place could be recognized and adapted into something that had meaning for a much larger audience. And I think Loretta has been wonderful at, at spotting those conversations. She clearly recognized that this is an issue hugely important for our time. One of her major strengths as director over the years is that she does organize exhibits and invite artists and architects to come address very pressing problems and issues in the world today. And I think that's an important role for a museum. It's aesthetic, of course, but it's also about opening people's eyes to issues of the day. The UMCA is a tremendous resource for us in the art history department because we have these practicum. One is the student educator practicum, which is hugely popular and very successful and incredibly good for the student's self-esteem. And as a teaching museum, to create a platform for young people to become curators and to have experience because frequently you are going as a graduate student to some museum and have a low-level job and you have to learn this by doing. And having a deep knowledge already of the workings of a museum and being a curator gives them an amazing advantage over other things. When I was doing the student museum education program, I was super excited because when my parents or my siblings came to campus, I was like, well, I have to take you to the museum so I can give you a little bit of a tour. I think I brought my grandparents and my aunt here when they came. I interned at the Frick Collection in New York City in the art education department. I also interned at the Peggy Guggenheim Collection in Venice, Italy. That um, was an experience of a lifetime something that I probably would not have considered applying to if it wasn't for my introduction here. A lot of students um, in my uh, period, including myself at times, became a little bit lost because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Something important was that I found this place that I was able to be a part of when I came back to campus uh, because that was definitely a hard transition uh, for a lot of us. Definitely the UMCA gave me confidence to, to keep going to apply to certain internships and I think that started definitely with Collecting 101, the course. 
I felt proud as a student to, to have a voice and also to have a, a concrete contribution. We're always trying in the art history program to provide that kind of hands-on experience for our students. So it's not purely academic, but there's some way of ap applying those research skills. I work with students on this exhibition at the UMCA, which was on a local artist, Avital Sagalan. And she was 90 and had never exhibited her work, and we, there were three undergrads who worked on this together. Generally, a university museum doesn't let an undergrad be a part of something like that. It's for MA students, and this was a risk that Loretta was willing to take, and it was hugely successful and so meaningful to Avital, who'd been through World War II and had um, emigrated from the Nazis, and for her to have this moment of glory and recognition was profoundly moving. That passion and that love for bringing stories that are sometimes muted like to full volume is, it's infectious. I'm really happy with this. I mean, it really just all the rooms seem to be. She's an incredible communicator of what it means to build a life dedicated to artists, works of art, and to students. You get inspired by Loretta and you just want to do more and you want to help and you want to engage with whatever she's bringing to campus because you know it's going to be good and you know it's going to be worth it. I've been waiting 15 years for this opportunity, for this pleasure, for this honor to work with Ronnie Horn and to have this exhibition here at the university, to have it here in Africa. I am constantly amazed at the people and the work that she brings to UMass. I don't know how she has done it. I don't know how sometimes the folks she brings in agree. I recall the first image I associated with Iceland from childhood. It was that of a horizonless ocean at the center of the earth. I knew it was Iceland because Jules Verne had decided, discovered, or determined that the entrance to the center of the earth was located there. With all the years and all my travels, the truth of this insight has only deepened. We know our students come from all over the world. We know that they're carrying way too many classes, way too many thoughts, way too many books. At the same time, they're in college to equally importantly learn about themselves in the world. And museums are places for that formation. We're not saying this is something you should know, we're saying this is something you could know. That, for me, is how academic museums are at the forefront of the field. Academic museums are also the largest block of free museums in the United States. And so they become these gateways to colleges and universities at a time when colleges and universities are being politicized. They become these spaces of public wonder. They are one of the few spaces left in our world where people from all religious backgrounds, people from all political backgrounds, views, can still find the same work of art joyous, can still wonder at the range of methods in a print, right? And, and that shared humanity it's infectious. It's, it's, it's becoming more and more radical. And it's becoming necessary.